In the early 1800s, if you were a European citizen and hadn't contracted some form of incurable disease, been pressed into military service, or lost a limb in a factory accident, chances are you were contemplating a bold move to the brave new world. After all, the old world was getting a little bit uh, crowded, to say the least, uh, with empires expanding left and right, snatching up territories like they were playing an aggressive game of risk. The British Empire, never one to miss out on a good land grab, had painted a sizable portion of the globe with a respectable shade of red. Meanwhile, the Spanish Empire was clutching onto its American territories like a toddler hoarding toys, and the French were doing whatever it is that the French do when they're not busy being revolutionary. Dans ce café plein de charme, refait du matin. Amidst the chaotic scramble for land and power, the average European citizen began to think, perhaps there's a slice of paradise out there for me too. Enter the New World. A place of untamed wilderness, endless opportunity, and a surprisingly alarmingly high rate of being bit by something that will kill you. Now, in the era of explorers and adventurers, few names stood out like that of Gregor McGregor. With a name so nice they named him twice. Well, actually just once, but it does roll off the tongue, doesn't it? Uh, he was the epitome of a well-respected gentleman, sporting a resplendent military uniform and a lineage that he assured everyone was both noble and entirely legitimate. McGregor was the kind of man you trust to watch your house, your dog, and perhaps even your spouse, maybe? His military service was nothing short of honorable, or at least that's what the brochures said. Having fought valiantly in the Venezuelan War of Independence under the famous Simon Bolivar, McGregor was awarded lands in gratitude for his service. These lands were, according to him, the Principality of Poye, gifted by the native Mosquito King. A tropical haven teeming with fertile soil, abundant resources, and presumably not a single mosquito, despite the suspiciously uh, similar name, one might say. Now, with the flair of a seasoned showman and the persuasive skills of a door-to-door -door encyclopedia salesman, McGregor set about promoting Poyer to the hopeful masses of Britain. He published elaborate guides detailing the bountiful opportunities awaiting settlers, rivers glittering with gold, forests ripe with mahogany, and a climate so agreeable that one might consider it downright impolite to complain about the weather. Investors were unsurprisingly intrigued. Here was a chance to get in on the ground floor of a burgeoning nation, without the usual inconveniences of, say, reality. McGregor began selling land certificates and even established a Poyasian embassy in London, complete with a flag, a coat of arms, and probably a secret handshake. Ships were chartered, and settlers eagerly packed up their belongings, bidding farewell to the dreary drizzle of Britain for the promised sun-soaked land of Poyer. They dreamed of starting anew, building homes, cultivating land, and perhaps founding a small pub where everyone knew their name. The voyage across the Atlantic was, by the 19th century standards, only moderately awful. Seasickness, scurvy, and the occasional storm were considered mere trifles when one paradise awaited them on the other side. Spirits were high as the settlers finally approached the coast of their new paradise homeland. However, upon arrival, it became apparent that Poye was less of a thriving utopia and more of an uninhabited stretch of mosquito-infested jungle. There were no grand buildings, no established ports, not even a welcome community with a fruit basket. It was as if the entire country had decided to take a prolonged lunch break and forgotten to inform anyone. Confusion turned to concern, and concern swiftly escalated to panic as the settlers realized they had been sold tickets to a destination that existed primarily in McGregor's imagination. Lacking adequate supplies and facing the harsh realities of the environment, many succumbed to disease and starvation over the coming weeks and months. Those who survived did so through sheer tenacity and the begrudging assistance of nearby British colonies, who were both likely sympathetic and mildly amused by the situation. As whispers of the Poyer debacle began to circulate back in Europe, one might assume that McGregor's schemes would come to an abrupt end, but then one would be underestimating the audacity of a man who could sell sand in the Sahara Desert. 
You see, as the rumors of the Poirier debacle began to waft back to Britain like the smell of overcooked haggis, one would think Gregor McGregor might consider a low-profile career change, perhaps alpaca farming or lighthouse keeping. But instead, displaying the tenacity of a leech in a blood bank, he set his sights on a new horizon, France. The French, ever fond of grand adventures with a revolutionary spirit, seemed like the perfect audience for McGregor's encore performance. So with a fresh set of brochures, now with 30% more embellishment and entirely in French, he crossed the channel to spread the gospel of Poyer. McGregor established a Poyasian legation in Paris, complete with a suitably impressive coat of arms and one imagines a selection of fine cheeses. He began issuing government bonds, promising returns that would make even the most hardened investors monocle pop. Land grants were sold, uniforms for the Poyasian army were commissioned, and dreams were woven into a tapestry of tropical allure. Emboldened by McGregor's charisma and the glossy allure of his promises, hundreds of French settlers prepared to embark on their journey to Poyer. Ships were chartered, including the aptly named La Nouvelle Cordelier, hopefully I pronounced that correct. As the settlers set sail, perhaps sipping wine and engaging in spirited debates about philosophy and the best way to tie a cravat, they were blissfully unaware of the fate that had befallen their British predecessors. Upon arrival, the scene was tragically familiar. Instead of a thriving colony, they found untamed wilderness. No infrastructure, no welcome signs, you know the deal. But in fact, they had the added addition of finding the occasional British corpse. Not exactly the best thing you want to see when uh, traveling to a new homeland. Stranded and ill-prepared, the settlers faced the harsh realities of disease, starvation, and the myriad of hazards of the Central American coast. Rescue efforts were slow and arduous, and many lives were lost. The survivors returned to France with tales that made the previous Poyer accounts seem like light-hearted anecdotes. Back in Europe, the Poyer scandal had grown too large to ignore. French authorities, not known for their uh, tolerance of such uh, wacky business, uh, arrested McGregor on charges of fraud. His trial was a spectacle worthy of the stage, with McGregor defending himself with a blend of eloquence and audacity that left many in awe. In a twist that would make any courtroom drama proud, McGregor was acquitted of his crimes. Whether it was due to lack of concrete evidence, his persuasive charisma, or perhaps the jury's admiration for his moxie, one might say, he walked out a free man. Now, not one to let a little bit of legal trouble dampen his spirits, McGregor promptly resumed his promotional activities, targeting new investors with the resilience of a door-to-door -door salesman, undeterred by a no solicitors sign. With France proving a tad uh, inhospitable to McGregor, the guillotines had been out of fashion for a while, but one couldn't be too careful. So McGregor returned to Britain. Undaunted, he attempted to float new bonds and even concocted plans for other settlements, like the imaginary Republic of New Granada. However, the British public had grown wary. Newspapers published exposés, and authorities issued warnings about his schemes. McGregor found the pool of gullible investors shrinking faster than a wool sweater in a hot wash. Not to be too discouraged, he tried his luck elsewhere, targeting the Dutch and even venturing into the realms of German finance. Yet, with his reputation preceding him, success was fleeting. Realizing that Europe was becoming less receptive to his brand of entrepreneurial creativity, McGregor decided to return to Venezuela. In a move that could only be described as audaciously cheeky, he applied for and received a military pension from the Venezuelan government, citing his earlier service in their fight for independence. Settled in Caracas, McGregor lived a relatively quiet life. Perhaps he spent his days reminiscing about the glory of Poyet, drafting plans for imaginary nations, or simply enjoying the tropical climate that he had so enthusiastically marketed to others. He passed away in 1845, leaving behind a legacy as one of history's most notorious con artists, a man who sold dreams woven from the finest threads of fiction. McGregor's story is a testament to the power of charisma and the lengths to which people will go to when offered the promise of a better life. His ability to convince educated investors, seasoned military officers, and hopeful settlers of the existence of a non-existent nation is both a remarkable feat and a cautionary tale. 
The Poirier scheme remains one of the most elaborate frauds in history. It highlights the vulnerabilities of societies eager for prosperity and the ease to which truth can be manipulated by those with sufficient confidence and a well-tailored uniform. That is the story of Gregor McGregor. Now, if you liked this video, I have two other channels that make videos just like this, but in different genres, so I'll leave a link for those down below. Hit the subscribe notification bell, you know the deal, and I'll see you guys in my next video.